The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. What a difference a day makes. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our risen, reigning Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, soon to return. Amen. Dear brothers and a few sisters in Christ, great to be with you this morning, and I'd like to look at this Old Testament lesson and all that God would want to share with it uh, to us. Now, unfortunately, we don't have about 40, 50 days just to study the text, so please uh, pray for this humble attempt. I'd like to begin with a premise, and I would like for you to just indulge the premise and uh, bear with me, and then we can talk about it later, but here is that premise. I think it's almost impossible for the average American church-going family, Lutherans in Michigan also, to ever truly experience a life-changing spiritual revival. Bear with me. I believe that families are absolutely, totally maxed out in their commitment. Every ounce of energy, every moment of time, every dollar of income, every modicum of ability is basically committed to the hilt. Done. Let me explain. I do believe that the average American individual is a very industrious person. Generally, adults will leave about 6 a.m. in the morning, sometimes earlier if they have children. They'll return by 7 p.m. and they're somewhat exhausted. The workload they carry is tremendously taxing and demanding. But here's the general philosophy. Get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the lid and poison the rest. Work is inscribed on every rung of the ladder that we call success. As Deb Casper says, Rob's wife, we worship our work, we work at our play, and we play at our worship. The work habits of the average American are really focused on materialistic things as well. There is a constant quest for things, for more, and it's becoming of increasing importance. And not only are Americans industrious and materialistic, they are also recreational. I enjoy recreational activities as much as the next person, but there seems to be an unholy preoccupation with sports and recreation. And of course, we're a technological people. When's the last time, maybe even around your household table, unless you're tremendously disciplined and are told by an appropriate wife, turn off your phone, that you were looking at your smartphone. Or maybe you go out to dinner and every member of the family wanting to know what's happening now. Furthermore, Americans are a mobile people. We love the opportunity and the means to be able to travel, and we love, it seems, to travel on the weekends. Not necessarily you, I get it. But I'll tell you what happens with travel, and you know it in your congregation. It becomes an impediment to consistency and faithfulness to Christ and worship within the church. There are many other faults that could be listed and discussed, but I'd like to add just one more to being industrious and materialistic and recreational and technological and mobile, and it's this. We are also a religious people. Religion survey say are very important is very important in our lives however there is very little evidence that it is more important than anything else that's going in on in our lives christianity in fact seems to be particularly nominal in adhering to what we would state are biblical standards in fact, many would say that Christianity in America today is something of an anemic thing, and maybe that's why it has been stated that third world Christianity has more power and potential for changing the world than the brand of Christianity that is normally found in the United States today. Consequently, because of this overcommitment, there is little time for concerted prayer, a waning interest in personal Bible study, and scarcely a passing interest of any kind in spiritual renewal, and, and think spiritual disciplines here. So here's the question. 
Are we so locked into who we are and what we are? And we love to use labels. Biblical, cultural. How about missional, confessional? Practical, theological. Liturgical, contemporary. Already justified, already sanctified. That there is absolutely no will to change or to grow or to mature in Christ. Is what we are experiencing in the church as good as it's ever going to get? Where is the passion and the purpose and the trust that we had in the Word of God? Where is the passion and the love for God and trust for Him? Where is it? The truth is, and I quote John Kleining, we have all, if we have all of God we ever want, we have all of God we will ever get. In our text from Ezekiel 37, we're going to see how the breath of God, the very breath of God, transformed and revitalized a decaying, desolate boneyard into a dynamic battalion of marching people. The words tell of the restoration of the nation of Israel, but they speak loads to us individually, to our congregants, and to our congregations as well. We can see what God can do, what God can accomplish through the charge and the dynamic of the Holy Spirit that he promises. So I'd like to share just a few thoughts. Here's the first one. You know what's absolutely necessary? The presence of the living God. Ezekiel himself was delivered and directed to a place of death and desolation by divine mandate. Listen, then he caused me to pass by them all and... Behold, there were many in the open valley, and they were indeed exceedingly dry. God himself gave the prophet a guided tour of this valley full of dry, dead bones. And the more God showed him, the more the prophet realized truly how helpless and hopeless this situation was. There was no sign of life, only a reminder of what had been of better days. Listen again to what God said in Ezekiel chapter 2 when he's calling the prophet. Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I don't think many of us encountered congregations that are as unreceptive, rebellious, and unrepentant as Ezekiel went to. Similarly, when the great prophet Isaiah exhorted Israel to obey God and they did not receive his message with gladness, we are reminded what he said to Israel. For I know how stubborn you were. The sinews of your neck were iron and your foreheads were bronze. When Stephen defended his faith before the high priest and all of the Sanhedrin, he encountered a defiant audience. Listen to him. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Now, they weren't always like that. There was a day when they were filled with life and they trusted the promise of God. They trusted the purpose of God and they trusted to praise God, to give him all the honor and the glory. There was a day when they were excited to be the people of God. There was a day when they longed to hear the word of God. Do you remember when, maybe you were at the seminary, remember it was prior to the seminary, remember you can go back to when you were a kid and you were in Sunday school and just to hear the word of God, there was a bubble, there was an excitement, there was an overflowing joy. You anticipated later on as you grew in the faith, meeting with God and basking in his love and grace and soaking in it. Do you remember when you had an unquenchable fire for the things of God? You can remember that. But somehow it's been stifled. Where's the fire? Where's our passion? Please listen. And yes, I preach to myself. Sin in its most damnable, destructive power 
is most often seen, I believe, in us in apathy, indifference, and a lack of thanksgiving. When King David realized this about his own life, about himself, and in particular about his sin with Bathsheba, he came to God saying, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Jesus in Luke 15, talking about the prodigal son, said that when he remembered he had sinned against God, he came to himself and sought forgiveness and restoration. And so must we. You know, it is so much easier to blame the music, the choir, the elders, the staff, the neighboring pastor, our spouse, than it is to realize that it is our bones that are exceedingly dry and desperately in need of God and an awakening. The more that Ezekiel saw, the more convinced he became that their only hope was God. God needed to intervene. Without a touch of grace, without a touch of God, those dry bones would remain dry. Without his, dry, his touch, those dry bones would remain dead. This much I know. I can write a message, and I can share it, I can preach it. I can provide some type of leadership, try and do that, and try and give some guidance. But I cannot give a passion for holiness. I cannot give a desire for living the Christ-filled life. I cannot put into any heart a hunger for the word of God and for the worship of God. I cannot make dry bones live. But like you, I know who can. What is needed is God only. What is in need by all of us is God's Holy Spirit always. God can do more in a moment than we can do in a lifetime. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. Ezekiel know, if you will, that he didn't know, or at least that he didn't have the answers that only God did. I love that Ezekiel did what King Jehoshaphat did back in 2 Chronicles 20 when he was facing a massive enemy. He was honest. He knew the only place that he could go was God with his ignorance, and so he did. And he said, For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. Knowing that he didn't know what to do, King Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord, proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. I wonder what that would be like in our congregations and district and synod. And in verse 4, asked help from the Lord. Like Ezekiel, he knew that he didn't have the answers, but that God did. What is needed is the presence of the living God. Come into his presence. What is also needed is the power of the word of God. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath into you and you shall live and then you shall know I am the Lord. Brothers, God created everything with a word. God spoke, and it was so. Let there be light, and there was light. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And brothers, God still makes things happen when he speaks, and God's word has lost none of its power. The only thing that will truly revive dry bones, the only thing that can come and renew lost hope is the word of God. 
If you want to live again, you have to have your hope renewed for the future. And then you come to the Word of God. God will do this for us. We need to rest in the Word of God. We need to meditate upon the Word of God. The Word of God. The prophet promised, hear the Word of the Lord, dry bones. Daily, be in the Word of God. Weekly, study the Word of God. Be in worship. Yes, be present as you lead. Hear the word of the Lord. Hem in your days with the word of God. Hem in your week with the word of God. Hem in your families with the word of God. Hem in your congregations with the word of God. For bones will remain dry and our hope will be lost unless we hear the word of God day after day. And quite frankly, it's more than just having a portals of prayer in the bathroom in the morning. It means digging. We remember Paul's words. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for you as well as to share, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, may be mature, may be complete depending on the translation, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How about Hebrews 4? For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We need that. God's word gives life. God's word gives hope. God's word connects us with God. If you want to be alive, you must hear and meditate on and pray the word of God. To revive dry bones, there must be for us the presence of the living God, especially our crucified Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, raised again for our justification, and the power of the word of God. And there must also be the proclamation and preaching of the word of God. Please bear with me. We love our doctrine. We love it. And I think we should be thankful. But it needs to be proclaimed. We need to share it. We need to trust that it can break the hardest substance known to man, and that is the sin encrusted heart. What did God tell the prophet to do? Prophesy to these dry bones. Can't you imagine Ezekiel being there? God says the same thing to you. I mean, this is a command to address the constituents of this unkept seminary, and this is an incredible ask by God. Ezekiel could have protested. You mean you want me to preach to all these dry, dead, bleached, white, powdered bones? What am I supposed to say? Seemingly an impossible task. Yet to say one word of exhortation or admonition to a valley of dry bones is what God asks, and it requires faith and confidence, and God gives that to you as well. I think, personally, that Ezekiel was encouraged by the cloud of witnesses and by the gallery that he knew about that were believing in God in the past and demonstrated that faith. How about Abel? who had given a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. How about Noah, who had demonstrated his remarkable faith by preparing an ark and warning a recalcitrant society at that time for a, do you know how long? 120 years. You aren't doing that. You can't. But Noah did. How about Abraham, the father of the faith? You know, all of these guys sinned, and this father did too. But God chooses him to be the father of the faith. How encouraging. How about Moses, who chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures that abounded in Egypt? How about King David? We talked about him earlier. Someone that had committed adultery and then murder, and yet God says of him, only of him, that he's a man after God's own heart. 
And this David wrote some of the greatest worship music and lyrics for time and eternity. Surely the knowledge of all these men allowed him, the prophet, to obey God. Let us think about what the Holy Spirit had the writer of Hebrews inscribed. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance. Could that possibly be our perpetual overcommitment? And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the suffering and despising the shame and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Sat down. The work is complete. Forgiveness is there for all. And by God's grace, we recognize and believe, and I pray, rest in it. And by his power, we now implement it. And finally, there is the promise of the Spirit of God. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds and breathe. And breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Jesus, I want you to remember the disciples hear about the tremendous work that he's going to be doing, what he's going to accomplish. And then he nails them with this. I have to leave. And by the way, it's a blessing for you. Here's why. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And this Jesus asked us, if you will, to prophesy to the breath, to pray for the Holy Spirit. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This Spirit will point us to Jesus, this living Spirit who empowers and creates life, who has the power to cleanse and revive and restore power to the body, the church, and his workers, promises to come. This much I know. Our efficiency turns out to be deficiency without God's sufficiency. We can agonize and organize and emphasize and publicize and in our worst moments euthanize, but we cannot produce life or renewal. It must come from God and his chosen means where the Spirit works, his word and his sacraments. Brothers, God can do more in one service than we can do in a year. God's power is wondrous. The psalmist declares, God hath spoken once, twice I heard it, that power belongs to God. Brothers, the breath that God breathed into man's nostrils was the breath of life. And the Lord who breathed on his disciples that second time that he appeared to them after his resurrection and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit is the same God who can breathe upon a boneyard in any congregation, in any hamlet or town or city, in Michigan or the world, and he can transform it into a marching, motivated battalion of believers. And may that be said of us. This last January, I had the privilege once again of, of going to Israel. And uh, you see many sites, and you absolutely know it correlates perfectly with the Bible. And one of those, or two of those really, interestingly, are the Garden of Gethsemane and the House of Caiaphas. And they know that, that that's for sure. Interestingly, as you're in the Garden of Gethsemane, you have the wall of Jerusalem over here. You can see the big corner. Right past the corner, you can view Caiaphas's house, which means that as Jesus was praying, 
he could see the torches coming his way. He knew. And by the way, right over his shoulder this way is the Judean wilderness. When they say wilderness, that's exactly what they mean. And you could get lost like this. In between in this valley, and I saw Dave just going like this, Dave Fleming, oh, the valley there. It is full of ossuaries, of caves filled with bones, of some caskets that are made of stone, basically a giant ossuary. It's just full. And so I asked our, our guide, I said, were, were these here when Jesus was here? He said, absolutely. He said, there, there, undoubtedly, there's the, some of the tombs of the great prophets and fathers are down there. I had a thought when Jesus was praying, and he saw all these dry bones. Could he not have been thinking of you? The word that you would proclaim, the life that would come, not only for you personally, but as you proclaim the word of God, and life was breathed into people that knew Jesus Christ and those that desperately need him and somehow come to hear through your ministry the good news of Jesus Christ. I know that he definitely saw you on Calvary's cross when he said, it is finished. For there was no sin for which he had not paid. Yours, Adam and Eve's, everybody that's lived before us, everybody that will come after us, all is done. But hold on to the thought that he prayed for you, for your ministry, your protection, and your proclamation. To the broken and barren, seemingly impotent pastor or congregation, our great God makes this promise of a renewed, revitalized, resurrected life. The presence of the living God, the power of the Word of God, the proclamation of the Word of God, and the promise of the Spirit of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God which can transform your heart and mind through faith in Christ Jesus. Guard your heart and mind in him. Amen.